Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in Emmett South. I'm Chris Cooper. Yellow Jackets, Crepe Myrtle, and Moonflower, what do they all have in common? They are all viewer questions we're going to answer on today's show. It's the Q&A show, just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. This week we're going to spend the whole show answering viewer questions. Every week we get more questions than we can answer on air. This week we are catching up showing you some of the answers we did not have time to air. Let's start off with a question about mosaic virus. We had a problem with mosaic virus in our garden last year. All of the green beans, tomatoes, and cucumbers got it and we ripped them out. My first question is, how much soil should be removed to make it safe to plant this year? I am thinking about using a fine netting to keep aphids and white flies out mm -hmm. this year. Are there any other steps that I can take to protect our garden? I have read several different suggestions online. Mm -hmm. What can I do to keep it out of my garden this year? And this is Tina in Evansville, Indiana. Okay. All right. So we're talking about mosaic virus. Yeah. Okay. So How about aphids? How about aphids? Yeah, okay. Insect, yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. insect pests can be a vector, yeah. you know, for this virus. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep the virus out? One of the things I, I try to do, you know, in, in there, I, I try to rotate my vegetables sometimes okay. in, in the different areas of the garden, crop rotation. You know, the, the crop rotation in there. Then you might want to try to buy a, buy a variety that mm -hmm. don't fight that off there, don't get that on there. So that's what I would do. I try to rotate my vegetables this year. I try to to a different location in there and see what it, they still get on there. In right. there, see, in there. Uh, and then you also you might want to just buy, like I said, buy, buy a variety that don't affect that in there. Cause you don't get like you see it on on, t on tomatoes and peppers and beans. Mm -hmm. You see it on there a lot of time in there. So I don't think it'll be in the soil in there. You don't think you probably need to move a lot of soil out of there in there. What do you no, you, yeah, you don't have to remove any soil. Okay, then. Thanks. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, so you're exactly right. So here are a couple of points that I like to mention. Okay. I always tell people to get virus resistant virus. seeds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, virus free seeds. Okay. Resistant varieties, Maybe, yeah. uh, which you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, something that would do. But here's something that's critical. Okay. Remove those weeds. With, with, okay. Because those are what the insect pests are. Okay. And again, yeah. they are the vector, right, for the virus. For the virus, yeah. So if you can remove those weeds, then, yeah, because we know the aphids will be in there, some of your other uh, insect, insect pests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, get those weeds out of there, practice good sanitation. sanitation. Uh, as you mentioned, crop rotation, crop, crop rotation is something yeah. else that mm -hmm. I would do as well. So if you do all of those things. You should be able to control that in there. You should be able to control that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should be able to control that in there. You should be able to control it. Don't I have to worry so, about yeah. it again removing the soil. In the soil in there, yeah. Should be mm -hmm. fine. But yeah, but yeah I always look for those resistant varieties yeah, yeah. and, and those virus-free seeds. Cause you don't want to start spraying a whole lot of chemicals around yeah. in the vegetable garden if you can help it. In if there. you can help it, right. Yeah, you can help right. it. Yeah, you don't want to start doing that. Like you said, try to move the weeds and everything and try to get rid of the problem. Right. If we will get on there. What is wrong with my cucumbers? They were growing great at first, and I got one or two small cucumbers produced. Now this, and this is run from Memphis. As you can see there, it looked like it just died out. It wilted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I actually think that's bacterial wilt. Probably. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's coming back. I don't think it's coming back. Yeah. Not from that. Hopefully he's got more cucumbers and he needs to get rid of that one, take it out and, yeah. and uh, destroy it. Yeah, that's going to have to come out. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, the vector for bacterial wilt is going to be the spotted cucumber beetle. Yep. So that means you got to control. Got to control the beetle. The beetle. Try to attempt to anyway. Yeah, because yeah. that's going to be hard. I mean, how do you be able to yeah, do that they're, really? Uh, they're strong pliers, yeah. and uh, uh, it's just it's really really hard when you talk about these these wilt diseases. That uh, uh, it's really it's almost impossible right. to you know control the insects. So we don't have we're not able to use insecticide that have a very long residual, mm -mm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, plant enough, plant a, plant a bunch of cucumbers, <laughs> and then and, 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 uh, when you see them, you can spray the cucumber beetles and 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 remove the plants that are affected. Yeah, because yeah, they're going to go from plant to plant. Yeah, you need to plant those cucumbers it. all up and down that fence. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Let them climb on up there. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. Using the uh, you know insecticides is going to be tough. It the is. Residual, it's like really, the neem oil, you yeah. know, and, and such. It's going to be tough. Yeah. 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 Um, 
-hmm. It's a tough one. The back, I hate wilt diseases. They, yeah. They're not very forgiving. Yeah. And like you mentioned, you have to take out the whole plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And get them out. Don't put them in your compost bin. No. You, know, you, no. Know, you put them in a, you know, bag them up and put them in the trash and send them to the landfill. Right. I seem to get more than my share of yellow jackets every year. How can I safely get rid of them? This is Paulette from Cock County, Tennessee. So she gets a lot of yellow jackets. How does she safely get rid of them? Well, the, <laughs> well? you know, the, the interesting <laughs> thing is that usually in the fall, mm -hmm. they are, it's the end of the season. So there's a lot of more of them to forage for food. Mm -hmm. And what they're going to go for is anything. Anything that we like to eat, they like to eat. So sanitation is probably the number one thing to get rid of them is make sure that there's nothing for them to eat. Okay. Uh, another thing they can do is simply avoidance. You can't, it, they, when these foraging in the late fall, they don't really care too much about you. They're not really going to sting you unless you start messing with them. So if you start swatting at them, then you're going to get stung. I mean, that's <laughs> not a good thing. Not a good thing. Um, of course, you, know, you see a, the Coke cans. If you're on a picnic and you have a, 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 a aluminum can with a beverage in it, be careful because sometimes they'll get land there and go into the, the lid before yeah. you notice it. So that you don't want to do that. See that? Mm -hmm. uh, repellents don't seem to work very well. DEET will help uh, have them avoid you. But don't wear perfumes and stuff when mm -hmm. you're hiking and, and out in nature because that attracts them. Um, traps work some, but if you're going to use a trap and you're trying to keep them away from your yard, put them on the periphery of your property so that they are attracted not exactly to where you mm -hmm. are, but away from where you are. Um, other than that, finding the nest is the best thing to do. But uh, when you do find the nest, if you can find the nest, because in the fall when they're all out there, it's very difficult to find the nest in the fall. It's earlier in the summer, it's easier to find mm -hmm. the nest. Um, be careful, you know, try to treat it in the, at night when they're all back in the nest and you can get a hold of them and, and get the, they say powders are better than sprays yeah. for nests, but you know, and don't shine lights on the nest either. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Shine the light away from the nest because they'll be they'll come out towards the light. Right. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. That's, yeah. That's a lot but yeah, yeah, sanitation probably number one uh, way to keep them away. Right. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. Around those yellow jackets. Mm -hmm. I, I know what that feels like to be stung by one. So you definitely have to be careful. And I lastly, agree. yeah, I mean, you mentioned the aerosol sprays and the, and the dust mm -hmm. and powders and things like that. Look for the active ingredient permethrin. Yes. And that should help read and follow the label. Yeah. But that's last on the list. Last, yeah. Our weeping cherry is about eight years old and has always bloomed beautifully and been healthy. This spring it had blooms only on the very top branches. Now that's where the only leaves are. The tips of the lower branches are dry and dead. There are no obvious problems that we can see. I'm sure it will have to come down, but I'm not, but I'm curious about what the problem might be. This is Mimi from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh-huh. Eight-year-old. Yes. Right? The leaves are only at the top. Right. But they're dry and dead at the bottom. Yes. So they're just curious. Well. What the problem may be. You know, it's a cherry tree. That's, that's, <laughs> that's probably the number one problem. There, the list so of, many problems. Yeah, the list of insects, boars, uh, and diseases that shot hole diseases. Cankers, boars. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But we had a very unusually mm -hmm. cold period uh, this winter. And I think whatever was stressing it before may have tried to finish it off with the cold. I had, I've been observing some cherries in an area where I live, and okay. there's only one of the four or five trees that is alive. And they've been beautiful all this to other, you know, the other years themselves. Right. So I think the cold really, when there, there were problems with, because cherries have lots of problems, the cold weather just kind of was the, the icing on the cake to finish them off and saying, hey, this is just not good. And they, you know, she can replace it if she wants to, but she's going to have the same problems because cherries are just fraught with problems in this area. Yes. Again, cankers, <laughs> boars, yeah. 
yeah. rots. Uh -huh. uh, they're thin bark tree. Yeah. You know, so Sun yeah. Skull. You, yes. you can name God. everything. Yeah. yeah. If if they're stressed out, they're gonna have problems. Right. So if you're gonna get another one, just make sure to keep it comfortable if you can. If you can. Yeah, if you can. And, and keep it sprayed for bores and yeah. you know, on a regular basis right. and that. Have to be help. on the spray schedule, that's for sure. I have a small problem. I have a flower box on the outside of my porch. It has an awning over it so the rain can't reach it. Nothing grows in it except plastic. What should I do? And this is Keith in Metz, West Virginia. So Peter, just a little small problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have a couple questions. Um, so do I. Are, are you watering it? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would think, yeah, yeah. you know, the rain can't reach it, yes, but okay. you know, it, things should grow in it <laughs> if you water it. Um, but my other question is, is what is the soil uh, in that, mm -hmm. in that planter mm -hmm. box? It might be worth it to actually, you know, I don't know how big it is, right. but to replace some, if not all of it. You know, if it's a small planter box, you can just dump it out and put right. new soil in it. If it's bigger, maybe dig out the top six inches and put in new soil because it, it could be that there's just no nutritional value in that soil. Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah. So I actually thought of those same two things. Same, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I thought about the soil because we don't know the size, right? Yeah, and then, right. yeah. yeah. And the soil might not have no nutrients in there, nothing like right. that. It might not have no water in the soil. Right. And that's why I nothing grow in there. Right. Yeah, okay. so I, I would try to change the soil out, put some new soil in there. I just see what's going on with that soil. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So and make sure you do water that you got an awning over there. So right. get, you a a water, yeah, yeah. get you a watering container. Yeah. Get a watering container there. Yeah. The other thing is, if it's under the awning, I don't know how much sun it gets. Yeah. Um, that's true. But probably a lot if, of shade. you know, if there's a lot of shade, you need to be growing shade plants <laughs> right. in there. What type of shrub is this, and when is a good time to prune them? They're 20 years old, and we tried to thin them out last year, and they look horrible. This is Joyce. So what? type of shrub is that? And I think we know this shrub will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it looks like a dwarf Burford uh -huh. holly. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, they don't usually use the regular Burford hollies anymore. It's always usually the dwarf Burford holly. However, dwarf is a relative term sometimes <laughs> yeah. because dwarf Burford hollies can get five to eight feet round, ah. which is not really a good size for a foundation plant, which is why she has to prune it. Right. And based on her picture that I see, um, hollies, this time of year in the spring, especially in the latter part of the spring, best time of the year to prune a holly mm, okay. because they're starting to get their new growth out. Mm -hmm. So you cut them down and then put a little fertilizer on them, complete fertilizer, like 13, 13, 13, nothing that's going to last all season long, just sure. a short. And with the spring rains and stuff, it'll rejuvenate that plant and it'll come back out. But if she cuts it, I mean, she wants to cut it down, it, it looks leggy in the prick picture, it, it just, just does. foliage up it on top. Does. And yeah. I would not be upset at all by cutting off the foliage part to make it yeah. shorter and just have bare wood because of the time of year that it is. Right. Uh, hollies are tough. And so it will come back out. So it will come back out. Mm -hmm. so, so how low would you cut it? I would just cut off, well, I would cut off all that foliage because the problem the, is the foliage, part? the foliage, it, it's been pruned in a vase shape. Yeah, you can and, tell, and tell that for sure. You, so the top is actually shading the bottom mm -hmm. part so it's not going to be able to, you know, come back out because it's not getting light. Right. So you want to kind of uh, prune shrubs, you know, in a, in a, in a, angle down. The, the widest part of the shrub should be at the base yeah. of the ground. That way light will evenly disperse itself all around the shrub. Right, that's a good point. So it's mm -hmm. just the opposite, pruned just the opposite of the way it really should. Right. So if you cut off that top that's shading the bottom, then the rest of it will come out. I know it'll be bare, but it'll don't bare. worry, <laughs> it's a holly. It will come back it'll out. Come back. I grow moonflower vines each year and have lovely blossoms. They are always big seed pots that I save. Sadly, they never germinate. I've tried layering the seeds in wet paper towels for several days. This always works with the store-bought seeds, but not my homegrown seeds. What do I need to do to get my homegrown moonflower seeds to germinate? Darlene, Hermitage, Tennessee. Guess what, it's Darlene? She knows a little bit about <laughs> the moonflower vines, right? Yes. And those seeds. So those why seeds. don't you tell us about that? Well, it's interesting. It's, it's from the tropics. Okay. And in the tropics, the seed is carried in the oceans. Uh -huh. 
So it's tumbled in the ocean, stratified by being tumbled in the ocean, okay. where then it lands on shore and, and, and propagates the area that it lands in. Sure, sure. And of course, now the tropics have a much longer growing season right. than we do. Okay. And so that's why we get a lot of questions sometimes, well, my moonflower hasn't bloomed yet. We because have. it right. it takes a long time. They like a long season to be able to bloom and set seed. And sometimes, even when they do set seed, they're not viable because they haven't had that long enough growing season to mature the gotcha. seeds. Okay. So that might be part of the problem, that they just aren't viable, so that's why they're not germinating. Okay. Or, I mean, that I even do this with store-bought seeds. I take either a nail file and, uh, and actually get that, huh? try to get that mm -hmm. seed coat, you know, a little bit thinner right. so that it'll soak up the Nick water. It up pretty good. And, and I actually like, so remember the ocean, they're tumbling in the ocean. So I always soak them in seed for several days. And mm -hmm. usually the viable ones will, will uh, sink to the bottom. Right, right. And then I plant those. Okay, so you'll soak the seeds in the water. Okay. Yeah, after okay. I've okay. put a nail file right. on them I or I've even, it. it's a little bit more dangerous to take a pruners <laughs> and try to n take a nip out of them. So yeah, I mean, either way, but right. you got to watch your fingers when you do it. Watch that. your fingers, yeah. Because <laughs> um, yeah, it's please. really hard seed and, and you're just trying to get that through that seed coat so the water can get in there and, and uh, swell the, mm -hmm. the seed. Yeah, and that process is scarification. That's what yes. that's called, right? So yeah, yes. once those seeds start to absorb water, mm -hmm. then it kicks off the germination process. Yes. Right. So there you have. Yeah, but be careful. If, yeah. If you're yeah. Pruners, yeah. That's why nail files work yeah, really nail well. Files. <laughs> yeah. And it just takes a little bit. You yeah. Know, really. Just, uh, just to do it. On. Make it thinner, coat so it'll the water can get in there. I have 13 crepe myrtle trees. All of them have these big knots on them that the branches grow out of. I have sawed them off on several trees and they grow back. Do I keep cutting the knots off? I really would like to know before I put all this work in again. Thanks, Marie from Chattanooga, Tennessee. So Peter, <laughs> the big knots, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> they crepe, keep growing, right? Crepe murder. Crepe murder. Crepe murder. <laughs> crepe murder. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so when you, whenever you prune a tree or any other plant, you're saying, you know, you cut it here, you're saying grow from this point. Yeah, grow here, grow here. So what's happening is the crepe myrtle's <laughs> doing exactly what you're telling it to do. You're cutting it here and then it goes poof, mm -hmm. right there. And that turns into a big knot, especially if you go back and remove all those branches every year. The knots just keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, looking at the pictures, there's, those knots are always going to be there, yeah. seeing how big the branches are that you're cutting. Um, now, there is a way that you can get rid of the knots. It will take several years, uh, and what you do is every year you'll, you go in and cut off one of those big branches at the ground. Mm -hmm. um, the plant will respond by sending up suckers because all of a sudden it doesn't have all of the top growth to match the roots. Uh, pick one of those suckers or two of those suckers and let them grow. Um, the next year, go in, remove another one of the big branches right at the ground and let it be replaced by a sucker. And so over the course of four or five years, what you're going to do is you're going to have the, the true form of the crepe myrtle without the knots because you've removed those. But if you keep cutting, <laughs> if you keep cutting the stalks every year, mm. the knots are just going to keep coming back and coming back. And they're so unsightly looking. It looks yeah. rough. It don't look good when you see that knots on there like that. No, it, I said we don't recommend that you prune a lot of prune on crepe myrtle unless you just really need a problem or something right. over your house or your roof or something like that. So mm -hmm. yeah. you don't have the ugly knots on there. Yeah. <laughs> unless they're in the way. In the way, yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah. And, and prune it like a tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, go in and if you don't want this branch, cut it off where it comes out of another branch. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and you can go in and if you want to, uh, in the winter, you can go in and tip all of the branches and remove mm -hmm. the seed pods. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, think of it as a tree, not as a shrub. Yeah, mm -hmm. limb them up and over. Over, yeah. Right, back to a main branch, yeah, right. a stem. Mm -hmm. That's what you should do. This is my cur al crab apple tree I planted a few years ago. This is the first time it had fruit. I plan to make crab apple jelly, so I need the fruit to be healthy, no black parts. What should I spray it with to prevent these spots on the leaves and on the fruit? Also, when and how often should I spray? 
Thank you very much. This is Juliet from East Memphis, Tennessee. So this is the first time she's had fruit on her Kerr crab apple tree, which is good. It is good. Which is good. Very so we good. congratulate you on that, Miss Juliet. Now she wants to know what to spread it with. Well, I also want to congratulate her for making crab apple jelly. Oh, yeah, right, right. Because crab apple jelly is my favorite jelly. Uh, but right. that is, uh, that's good. That is really good. Uh, <laughs> but the Kerr crab apple is actually a, a, a cross between an apple and a crab mm -hmm. apple. And it's older than I am. They did that back <laughs> in the early 50s. But it's uh, the, what, Malus Doggo crab apple crossed with a Harrelson apple. I didn't know that. And, okay. uh, and so follow a regular okay. apple uh, cover spray. And that's simply uh, using a, a mixture of Captan and Malathion. Mm -hmm. uh, you can mix it yourself or you can get a home orchard spray yeah, that contains those ingredients and, and go with a cover spray and that should control all of the, I mean the same diseases attack crab apples that attack apples. Right. And, uh, and if you follow a regular apple uh, home orchard spray guide, you know, you'll, you should be okay. okay. So what do we think is causing the black spots? Uh, there's there's several fungal diseases that, that could cause that. Uh, bitter rot is one. Uh, there's white rot that gets on, on, on apples. Uh, anthracnose yeah. and, and yeah. se several, several yeah. diseases that gets on uh, the leaves and the fruit. I don't worry as much about trying to identify a specific disease on, on any fruit really because the cover sprays should take care of all sure. the diseases. and, and uh, uh, the only thing is if it's a bacterial spot or something like that, uh, the fungicides won't, won't help you with right. that and you've got to do something a little bit different. But uh, from the way she described it, black spots on the leaves and on the fruit, sounds like it's uh, just, you know. Yeah, it's not going to be that big of a deal, right? I don't, I don't think right. so. I right. don't think so. Yeah. And um, this is East Memphis, so yeah, you think about, you know, right. early this spring, yeah, it's been wet, oh, a lot it's of, been cool, a lot of, it's been windy, right. you know, as well, so right. yeah, I'm not surprised you know, right. to see black spots and things like that. Yeah. What are these holes in my pine tree? Are they caused by bees? The holes are a fourth of an inch wide and about seven feet up in the air. Christian in tw Twin Lake, Michigan. Oh. So what are those holes? We've seen those holes before. I've, I have some in my yard, holes. yes. Yeah? Um, they are from a bird, oh. the uh, sap sucker woodpecker. Uh -huh. Because he, he wants those holes, he comes back and revisits them because he'll eat the sap that comes out of them. And sometimes insects are attracted to it yes. and he'll eat the insects too, so get some protein with his you know, pine sap. Uh, and I say, get your binoculars and enjoy. Just enjoy, right? Yeah. All right. And they will not harm no, the tree, right? Not going to harm the tree. Not going to harm the tree. So they're just after the carbohydrate-rich sap. That's right. Right. And then, yeah, occasionally you get insect pests in there, and they go after that too. Uh huh. My rattlesnake pole bean sprouted, and the first leaves are pale yellow. Could a nitrogen deficiency show this early? It is a problem with about half of the 30-foot row, and this is a shell. Interesting question. Could a nitrogen defici deficiency show this early? It could. Yeah, it could. Yeah. Very likely yeah. could. Yeah. Especially, you know, these, these uh, pole beans are uh, legume. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the rhizoctonium or the rhizobium bacteria mm -hmm. is present in the soil, uh, you probably won't see that. And probably on half that row, they were probably or possibly assuming the drainage and everything oh, is right, the same. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, there may have been beans there last year, and, and if she's planted these pole beans in an area where there weren't beans last year, if there was corn there, or and there hadn't been beans there or a legume there for a lot of years, uh, then that can happen. Uh, we planted a soybean plot at Murray State this year, and half of it was planted where there had not been any beans for years and years and years. Right. It had been corn and grain sorghum. The other side was soybeans. And soybeans are a legume, yeah. and to this day, the soybeans are taller where we had soybeans last year. And normally, we recommend rotating crops. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You rotate crops; oh, that's a good that. thing, and you'll right. do better. But we did not inoculate those soybeans. In the, in the, and, and, and there's a difference. And when they came up, they were just like this. They were little. They were kind of yellow. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you know, you don't usually have to put 
nitrogen on legumes. You know, normally you don't have to, apply. I mean, they do yeah. their own, they get the nitrogen yeah, because of the bacteria yeah. fixes right. it. And, yeah. Yeah. But yes, that could very likely be, uh, and it'll grow out of it. Right. You know, uh, it'll yeah. take a while. But uh, yeah, if, if everything else, you know, is, if everything's the yeah, same now, if that's same, lower, right. Right. If that, with all the rain that mm -hmm. we've got a lot of rain, if right. that's a, lo a little bit lower on that end, then it could be, uh, and you could have some root rot and mm -hmm. some things like that could so be could. creating a problem. So and, uh, but yeah. uh, but it is normal. Yeah, mm -hmm. you do see that, and you mm -hmm. can uh, mm -hmm. you know see those uh, pale yellow leaves you know pretty early right. you know, in the age of those uh, rattlesnake pole beans, which are good by the way. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on any of the questions we answered this week, go to familyplotgarden.com. We have all these questions listed on the home page. Thanks for watching and keep sending in the questions. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.